The Cavalcade of America. A little 10-year-old boy named Tom wrote this letter not long ago to DuPont, the sponsors of the Cavalcade of America. I like your program. I think we should all realize, even though we're very small, we have a big chance in this big world. Even though I'm only 10 years old, I take a great interest in your program. If it hadn't been for DuPont, many of the inventions wouldn't have been. I hope you will have many new adventures in the Cavalcade of America. Well, Tom, I hope you're listening this evening. We have two adventurous stories that I think you'll like. And thanks for your very nice, kind letter. Boys like you and girls, too, make the DuPont research chemists glad that they are able to be of service by creating better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra sets our stage for A Tale of the Sea with a specially arranged group of well-known sea songs.
America on the sea. To what better place can one look for so many of the finest traits of American character? For the skill and courage, the gallantry and perseverance, the audacity and bravery that have contributed in such rich measure to the nation's development. Let us turn back to the year 1851. A single word has sped with a mighty roar around the world. Gold. Swifter ships are needed to carry food and supplies to the clamoring horde in California, and New England genius is called upon to build them. We find Donald McKay, one of the greatest of all shipbuilders, with his friend, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in McKay's East Boston shipyard, where a great new ship is being fitted out, the Flying Cloud. So the Flying Cloud is ready for the sea, Donald. Ready and eager to be gone. No more so than our new owners, Mr. Longfellow. Sold already? This beautiful, graceful thing. Aye, she sold. A flying cloud was bought this morning by Messrs. Grinnell, Mentor and Company of New York for the California trade. It did not take them 15 minutes to make up their minds once they'd seen her. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me greatly, Donald, if I know anything of ships. Ah, but you're a poet. And do you think this ship is not a poem? Look up there, Donald, at your work. Those masts and spars, that intricacy of lines and rigging, so strong and yet so light. Ah, I doubt if I shall ever write a finer poem. Hard-headed businessmen are different, Mr. Longfellow. They want results. And I have guaranteed that she will reach San Francisco in a hundred days. One hundred days? If they let me choose her captain. And will they? They have. Do you see that man yonder? Standing by the after ladder. Yes. Captain Josiah Creasy, as fine a shipmaster as ever saw the quarter deck. Oh, Captain Creasy! Aye, sir. Come in. My friend Mr. Longfellow wants to shake hands with you, Captain. I do, sir. I envy you greatly, Captain Creasy. What a glorious experience to command this noble ship. But aren't you a little nervous? About what, sir? Making San Francisco in a hundred days. Why, it's, it's unheard of. Well, not when Mr. McKay says it can be done. Mrs. Creasy sails with me, sir. And between us, if we don't put the flying cloud in San Francisco within a hundred days, well, sir, we'll give up the sea and start to plant potatoes somewhere <laughs> inland. <laughs> in the private offices of the owners of the flying cloud, Messrs. Grinnell and Minturn on South Street, New York City. Samuel Grinnell looks up from his desk. Oh, sit down, ma'am. Take things easy. I tell you why I'm worried. That even betting that the flying cloud won't reach San Francisco. Yes, and Creasy's had the devil's own time getting a crew together. Nobody thinks she'll ever weather the horn. Look here, Grinnell. We don't know too much about Creasy. It's just possible that he's betting against himself and us. Yes. Well, I'd trust anyone Donald McKay recommended. You can ask Creasy yourself. I just saw him through the window crossing from the ship. Captain Creasy, gentlemen. Show him in. Morning, gentlemen. Good morning. morning. We're all in readiness. Ship's loaded and the last of the crew signed on. Captain Creasy, what's your honest opinion? Can she make it? Well, Mr. Minton, I won't fool you. No man can tell for sure. But I do know this. She's the sweetest thing I ever handled. And if hard driving will get her there, you can count on Josiah Creasy to do his best. Past Sandy Hook sails a flying cloud. Her royals and skysails set, and the crew rigging out her stuntle. Offshore, the breeze freshens. Now to a half gale, then to a gale. But her captain keeps everything on her. Three days out, on the quarterdeck, Mrs. Creasy is with her husband. There's hard squall coming, Josiah. I see it, Bessie. Here's the helm. Here's the helm. Well, what's wrong, man? The wind's taking charge, sir. Another man aft here at the wheel, Mr. Barrow. Another man at the wheel, sir. Ah, listen to her, Bessie. Jade knows where she's going. She's like a wild young colt, Josiah. Aye, and a handsome one. You hear that, Bessie? Aye. As long as she creaks, she holds. Steady, Hamsman. Aye, sir. Well, what is it, Mr. Barrow? It's Captain Crazy, sir. Hadn't we better make ready to shorten sail? Not yet, Mr. Barrow. Yeah, but look aloft, sir. Something will snap. Helmsman. 
Bring her closer to the wind. Closer to the wind, sir. She'll never stand it, Captain. We'll let the ship tell us that ourselves, Mr. Barrow. My furl course is in a lesser blow, sir. And the glass is falling. Let it fall, Mr. Barrow. Captain Creasy, sir, the men won't stand this. They're too young and green. Mr. Barrow, I'm master of this ship. And I'm keeping every inch of canvas on her till it blows away. I won't ease up while there's an inch of canvas clinging to a yard. <laughs> Across the equator, into the roaring 40s, Captain Creasy drives his ship with a bone in her teeth and the wind screaming through her shroud. He loses sail, springs spars, sets up new rigging, but always he fights for the last mile he can get out of each day afloat. But as they near the horn in the middle of the southern winter... Oh, but... Now look here, lads. It's now or never. Do we stand up for our rights or don't we? We better if we ever hope to see dry land again. Oh, yeah, if the old man keeps up his crazy driving, we're done for I've been around Cape Stiff in midwinter, and I know. He's mad. That's what he is. Oh, the old woman ain't much better. Willing to kill us to, to clip a few days off the run. All right, then. We stick together. Yeah. Uh, here's Mr. Barrow. He's with us. Hey, what's, this, what's this mean, men? Oh, Why aren't you just saying? Well, you I'll do the talking, boys. We got a complaint to make, Mr. Barrow. We don't hold with the way this ship's being run. Oh, sure. Now, that'll do, lad. I can't help you none. I'm in the same position as yourselves, obeying orders. Look here, sir. We're through obeying orders that are as good as suicide. We're going to see the captain. Yes, sir. Come on, man. Come on. You please. Aye, sir. We'll go aft with you, sir. Come on, lad. What's this, Mr. Barrow? Why aren't these men on duty? It's this way, sir. Well, the men are very resentful, sir. Resentful? Of what? The way this ship's being driven, sir. Yes, captain. Mutiny, huh? Mr. Barrow, why wasn't I informed of this before? Well, I didn't know, sir. Well, there's no mutiny, Captain. All we ask is reasonable sailing. Reasonable sailing. You'll sail this ship my way or not at all. We're going to make the Golden Gate in a hundred days if I have to put you on all iron to do it. Uh, uh, stand uh, back uh, there. Uh, I'll stand for none of this. Bessie. I'm here, Josiah. Have the boatswain call the afterguard. Yes, Josiah. The boatswain call the afterguard. How many of you are mixed up in this? There's not a man aboard. Answer my question. This watch, uh, mainly. You see who's sailing this ship? Bessie's the after guard here. They're here, Josiah. Both and take these men aft. Call out the other watch. I'll attend to them later. All right, sir. We'll go on. Uh, Mr. Barrow. Just a moment. Yes, sir. I have an impression you are in sympathy with the men. Well, sir, you've taken brutal chances. That's all I want to hear. Mr. Barrow, you may consider yourself as supercargo. From now on, Mrs. Creasy will act as mate of the flying cloud. Cape Horn in winter blizzards, and the long drive north through the Pacific begins. Day after day, Creasy and his wife drive their ship on, replacing gear, fishing yards, bending new sails. Finally, she drops anchor inside the Golden Gate. The gig is lowered, and Creasy is rowed ashore. On the waterfront, a cloud begins to gather. <laughs> Look at that. You know about that. What ship is that? That's what got us guessing, stranger. I tell you, she's a McKay ship. What? I sailed in the Staghound, not no, shouldn't I? Keep cool, keep cool. We'll find out in a minute. Hey, geek, ahoy! Ahoy! What ship is that? The Quiet Cloud. 89 days, 21 hours, not a candy hook. 89 days. Did you hear that, boys? 89 days from New York. It's a record, boys, a record. Let's give him the freedom of the city. Three rousing cheers. From New York to San Francisco in less than 90 days. A record that was never equaled under anything like the conditions encountered by the flying clouds. To China, across the Atlantic, the American clippers race, showing their heels to all the sail afloat, giving the sea the most gloriously picturesque period it had ever known. The clippers swiftly vanished, but the breed of men who sailed them remained to bring glory to America in later days.
Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, moves on. It is January 1926. Raging gales are sweeping the North Atlantic. Midway between Europe and America, a small British freighter wallows in the hurricane-driven seas. Her steering gear gone, her decks awash, water rising in her forward holds and engine room. On the bridge, a quartermaster clings to a powerless wheel, while beside him stands the captain. Hold on, sir. Here's another. Uh, it's getting worse, quartermaster. I say, and her life's gone out of her completely, just like a log she is, sir. Yes, I know. I wonder where Mr. Graham is. Lucky if he ain't washed overboard. The wind's blowing 80 miles or more, Captain. There's Mr. Graham now, sir. I'll slide back the door, sir. Hurry, sir! We lose the pilot out! How are things below, Mr. Graham? They look pretty bad, sir. In what way? The chief won't admit it, but he's given up hope of ever fixing the steering gear. He's got his engines turning over? Yes, but not for long, sir. Water's making in the ash pit. What else? Another lifeboat ripped clean out of the davit, sir. Both forward hatches sprung, and the glass still dropping. It's down to 28-6. Mr. Graham, I don't want to call for help. Is there no hope whatever? I believe not, Captain. And there's 25 men aboard. And our wireless may fail us at any hour now. Ah, uh, I suppose you're right, Mr. Graham. Well, send this SOS. British Peter and you know. Position unknown. Rough latitude, 46.1. Rough longitude, 39.8. <laughs> One hundred and fifty miles to the westward, the United States liner President Roosevelt, Captain George Freed commanding, is bound east for Europe with mail and passengers aboard. It is 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. There is a knock on the door of the captain's cabin. Yes? Who is it? Well, this operator, Captain. Oh, come in. What message, sir? An SOS. What ship? British Red Antino. Uh, what's the position, Mr. Smith? 46.1 north, 39.8 west, noon yesterday. Present rate of drift to east, two knots. I could just pick up a radio, sir. Anything else? The captain of the Aquitania has been calling, sir. Wants to know our position. Where is the Aquitania? South-southwest of here, about 100 miles, sir. Course, northeast to quarter east. Speed 14 knots. We're much closer, sir. Call the Aquitania and tell her the Roosevelt is proceeding to the Antinoe. Let the freighter know we're on our way. I answer. <laughs> Ten hours later, on the Antinoe, Captain Toes and his first officer are inside the battered bridge staring out into the swirling pall of snow. Oh, it's hopeless, Mr. Graham. They'll never find us in this snow. Don't say that, sir. We know the Roosevelt's getting closer. Aye, and she might come full on us in this murk and never know it. This squall of past, sir. It's clearer now than it was. Uh, that's more comfort, Mr. Graham. It'll be dark before we know it. Our lights are gone. The wireless won't hold another hour. Have we a thing on board to signal with? I have a pocket flashlight, sir. That's all. A pocket flashlight in this weather. <laughs> Captain, hold that door, man. Captain, sir, yes. we just heard the steamer's whistle. I swear we did, sir. In what direction? Yeah, we couldn't tell, sir. We we heard it twice. Faint like through this storm. Might have been anything, Captain. Don't place much more light. I tell you, we heard it, Mister Graham. Oh, look, look, there she is. Where? Ahead to starboard, sir. Oh, I, I can't see her now. He's right, Captain. Uh, He's right. She's almost dead ahead, sir. Less than half a mile away. You'll see her when we lift again. <laughs> On the Roosevelt's bridge, a short January day has drawn to its close. Quartermaster. Yes, sir. Keep that searchlight moving. Very good, sir. Slow engine steerage way, Mr. Miller. Yes, sir. Signal the engine room. Engine slow ahead. Engine slow ahead. Searchlight's worse than useless, Mr. Miller, in this snow. We've lost her again. Keep them moving. Now, they may help give those poor devils on the Antinoe more hope. What do you think happened to her, Mr. Miller? She simply vanished, Captain. Do you think she may have founded? Possible. But that wheat's falling in her hole, and if she is afloat, our chance of ramming her is excellent. We must take that chance, sir. We cannot abandon. Keep a sharp lookout from all parts of the ship. We'll maintain steerage way and try to work out her drift. Seventeen hours later, in the Roosevelt's first-class smoke room, a handful of passengers cling to lashed furniture. I wish someone would do something about that whistle. Oh, yeah. It gets your nerves in time. Yeah, it got mine 12 hours ago. Well, 
I can't understand why Freed persists in crying. That freighter was a derelict when we found her yesterday. It, it's an absolute impossibility that she can still be afloat. It's the worst storm I've seen in all the times I've ever crawled. Yes, and if we did sight her, what then? A lifeboat couldn't last a second in those seas. Not a second. Oh, I'm for bravery where it can do some good. But Just a minute. Wait. There's a second officer. Mr. Erickson. I'm sorry, gentlemen. There's nothing new. How long is this going to continue, officer? Till we find her or the captain quits the search, I'd say. Yeah, but how could you get those 25 men off the Antonov? I couldn't say, sir. But every man on board the Roosevelt has volunteered to make a try. Uh, say, what's happened to the whistle? Why, it stopped. Look, something's doing out on deck. Volunteers, be your cases. By Jiminy, they've found her. They're going to launch a lifeboat. Come on, men, let's get out there. Yeah. On board the freighter Antono, 25 half-frozen, despairing men huddle in the shelter of the after deck house, staring with salt-encrusted eyes at the nearby liner. For two days now, they have watched a score of attempts to rescue them. Three lifeboats smashed, two men drowned, lines snapped, gear ripped asunder on the heaving waves. Now another boat is being lowered from the liner. The 25 aboard the freighter have long since abandoned hope. There's not one chance in 10 million. That boat will found as the others have. Look at her. One more wave like that and she's a goner. She must have taken water that time, Mr. Grimm. Yes. But look at those men row. There are sailors in that boat, Captain. Blimey. What are they doing now? They're not turning back. No, sir. The officers are bringing your boat sides to gain what drift you can and clear our bows. Hi, mate. Look at that. She's going like a runaway express plane. But wait till he tries to come around. That'll be the finish. Grimm. Look at them, men. I'm almost beginning to believe they can make it. Oh, row, you row, row. Dear God, help them. Give them strength. Pray, you sailors. Pray. They're going to make it. They're going to tear up now. Give them a cheer, lad. Many <laughs> men. We're not up here yet. How many of you can jump without help? Help to be spared. You want us to stand by, sir? Not yet. You there, by the corner of the deck house. Can you see the lifeboat? Aye, aye, sir. She's 50 feet off our port now. Make it to the mission. There she is, sir. Coming out, shipping water as fast as they can bail. Ahoy! Yeah! Ahoy, you have to know! Stand by the top of the Ahoy! The first lifeboat reaches the liner's side in safety. In the darkness hours later, a second is launched. It makes the freighter turn. The minutes pass. A small white spot is seen in the path of the liner searchlight. It fights the long climb of a wave, stays poised an awful instant on its crest, and then plunges down, down, down as the passengers on the Roosevelt watch. I can't stand it, John. Oh, it's horrible. Now, now, it's all right, dear. They're, they're going to make it. Oh, they must make it. They must. Keep this face there. Oh, John. Oh, no, it's all right. We're, we're not in the way here, dear. Look, look, look honey. What? Look. There it is. They're coming in now. Oh, they'll be crushed against the side. No, no, no. They've got their boat hooks ready to fend it off. See? See, they're lowering the sling. All right. go. Can you see, dear? They're putting them in the net. I can see. It's... It's wonderful. Take a string on the net. Take off the sling. Oh, They're coming on deck. Oh, they're safe. They're safe. Mr. Miller reports all clear, Captain. The last of the Antonos crew on board and safely in the sick room. Thank you, Miss Erickson. Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. Be good enough to notify the owners. Say the rescue's been effected. The Antonos abandoned and the Roosevelt resuming voyage. <laughs> the days when the New England fishermen first built their barks and sailed north to the Newfoundland banks, down to the present age of steel and speed, the character of the men who manned the ships has been the same, courageous and skillful, gallant and persevering, audacious and brave. 
heroes of the sea, the cavalcade of America salutes you. American persistence in the face of difficulties, the willingness to tackle hard jobs and to carry them through to a successful ending, has always been an outstanding national trait. This spirit exists on land and sea, on farms, in cities, and among other places in chemical laboratories. Nothing illustrates the enterprise of chemists better than the story of cotton, that useful crop of our great southern state. I'm reminded of a motor trip I once took through a section of the south at cotton picking time. There's your wife's dress for next summer, I said to my traveling companion, pointing at the makers of white fluff. Well, maybe so, he said, and maybe it's part of your next year's automobile. Then he told me that Duco, the durable, glossy finish of so many fine cars, is based on cellulose obtained from cotton. Cellulose is the fiber forming the structure of most plants, and there seems to be no limit to the magic chemists perform with it. As far as automobiles are concerned, every time you look through a windshield or window of safety glass, you're looking through cotton. Because safety glass really is a sandwich of transparent cellulose plastic between two sheets of glass. Pyrolin is DuPont's name for one of these plastics. And it's also used for making an almost endless number of other things, from toilet articles to scuffless heels for women's shoes, from jewel cases to toothbrush handles. And curiously enough, every year millions of yards of luxurious rayon are produced from cotton cellulose. This gives you some idea about the importance of cotton to you and the importance of chemistry to cotton. As someone truly said, the future of the South lies in chemistry. These products are visible illustrations of the way DuPont's chemical research creates better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> week at this same time, you will hear the stories and melodies of songs that inspired the nation when DuPont again presents the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W.A.B.C. New York.